good morning and good afternoon uh, to everyone. Those in uh, Singapore, a good afternoon, and uh, those in uh, Europe, uh, good morning. Uh, welcome to this uh, new webinar of the Middle East Institute at the National University of Singapore. Uh, today we'll be discussing a question that may not be actually making the, the headlines of new news pro broadcasts, uh, which is, can Gulf countries end the war in Yemen? It has been now eight years since uh, Saudi Arabia decided to launch uh, an operation in Yemen. And at the time, the decision was triggered by an offensive inside Yemen led by the Houthis, an insurgency originating from the north. Houthis were supported by the former ruler of Yemen, Ali Abdallah Saleh, and by the fall of 2014, the Houthis were controlling the capital of Yemen, Sana'a. The legitimate government of Mr. Hadi was forced into exile in Saudi Arabia. For the first time, Saudi Arabia was launching a military operation of, of this scope. It built a coalition of the willing uh, that included eight Arab states, and most of the uh, military contribution relied on the United Arab Emirates and Sudan. The objective was simple, to defeat the Houthis and to restore the government of Mr. Hadi. The execution of the operation, however, was nothing but simple. Eight years later, we are still in a state of war. Last week, the United Nations succeeded in imposing a two months ceasefire, hoping that this could pave the way to a new momentum for peace. Yemen is by all accounts, the worst humanitarian crisis in the world today. The United Nations estimate that 377,000 people have died because of the war, including about 10,000 children, 24 million people, which represent about 80% of the population are in dire need of humanitarian aid. But despite all these numbers, despite the terrible cost of the war, there is a general tendency in public opinion, either in Europe, the US, or here in Singapore, to treat the war in Yemen as a secondary topic, a topic of interest only for experts in civil war or exper experts of the Gulf. Today, we will try to show that the war in Yemen has had and will have consequences that go beyond the borders of the country, as evidenced with the rocket and the drone attacks on Saudi Arabia and the UAE over the past months, the conflict has deep implications for West Asia. It also has implications for maritime security in the Indian Ocean, from Bab el Mandeb to the Strait of Hormuz. We've seen how the Houthis repeatedly attacked tankers and various ships at sea. It is also not possible to understand the recent tensions between Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, the United Arab Emirates and the Biden administration in the US without looking at the war in Yemen. Specifically, we cannot understand the UAE decision to abstain on the UN Security Council resolution of last month, the resolution condemning Russia's invasion of Ukraine without putting this abstention into the context of the war in Yemen. Finally, Yemen is a reminder, just like Afghanistan, that jihadi organizations such as Al-Qaeda and Islamic State are still alive and actively trying to benefit from the security vacuum. To discuss all these issues, we invited uh, two outstanding speakers with deep knowledge of Yemen and the broader region. Let me introduce them uh, before uh, leaving the floor uh, to our first uh, speakers. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Emil Hokayan, who's a senior fellow for Middle East security at the International Institute for Strategic Studies in London. Emil specializes in political and conflict analysis, including the wars in Syria, Iraq and Yemen, making him a very busy person, as you can imagine. Uh, relations between Iran and its Arab neighbors, that will be part of our discussion today as well. The rise of non-state actors, including jihadi groups and Hezbollah in Lebanon. Emil joined uh, the IISS in 2010. Before that, he worked as the political editor and international affairs columnist at the national uh, UAE-based uh, uh, newspaper. From 2004 to 2008, he was also a research fellow for the Middle East as the, at the Stimson Center in Washington, DC. He provides analysis on Middle East affairs on a regular basis to governments, corporations, and the media, and his commentary has featured 
in uh, the New York Times, the Financial Times, and the Economist, among other uh, media outlets. Our first speaker uh, will be uh, Dr. Elizabeth Kendall, who's a senior research fellow in Arabic and Islamic studies at Oxford University's Pembroke College. Her current work looks at how militant jihad movements exploit cultural traditions and local dynamics. Previously, she held positions at the universities of Edinburgh uh, and Harvard, as well as serving as director of a UK government-sponsored center focused on building Arabic-based research expertise. Dr. Kendall has lectured at governmental, military, and scholarly institutions all around the world and is a frequent contributor to international television and print media. She also sits on a variety of international boards and is the chairman of a grassroots NGO in Eastern Yemen. She's the author and the editor of several books, including Reclaiming Islamic Tradition, 21st Century Jihad, and she's currently working on a new book with a very intriguing title called Rock Stars of Jihad. She spends significant time in the field, uh, especially in Yemen. And uh, without further ado, uh, I will leave the floor first uh, to Dr. Kendall, followed uh, by Emil. Uh, let me share one map that will uh, definitely help uh, our discussion uh, this, mor this morning or this afternoon. Uh, and uh, without further ado, again, Elizabeth, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for that very generous introduction. Great pleasure to be with you this morning uh, in my European time and alongside my great respected colleague, Emil Okayan. Um, well, I was just going to give a very rundown of what's happening in Yemen now. Uh, that's going to be difficult after, after Dr. Saman's brilliant introduction, which is, I think, one of the best summaries I've heard so far of what's going on in Yemen and how it got there. But we might just cover a bit more of that territory. I'm going to take between 10 and 15 minutes so that we leave plenty of time for questions at the end. So my first that I want to make is in terms of the root causes of this conflict, they go back a long time in history and they also go back a short time in history. There are lots of conflicts at work in Yemen at the moment. Most importantly though, I think we need to realize that Yemen is not a naturally integrated state. It was until uh, about five decades ago, comprised of a number of small sultanates, uh, tribal fiefdoms, kingdoms and imamates, and it only consolidated into a north and a south Yemen in the 1960s. And those two bits of Yemen only consolidated into one country, into Yemen proper, in 1990. It only took four years then before they were at war with each other, north versus south. 1994, they went to war. And there have been all sorts of skirmishes along that fault line, that north-south fault line, after and before. Now, there were a lot of regional protests in Yemen throughout the 2000s that didn't really hit the international media, but, but they were there. People were discontented. And there was a whole uh, government that had institutionalized corruption and marginalized many areas. So this was not a happy integrated. The war proper began in 2014, 2015. In 2011, the Arab Spring, so-called, swept Yemen and eventually the former president, Ali Abdullah Saleh, been in power either in north or south or both for over three decades he fell from power but there were some big mistakes here big mistakes that helped to catalyze the war one was that there was no transitional justice for the fallen president he was given immunity and also the gcc initiative the gulf cooperation council initiative to transition yemen to a peaceful democracy uh, 
didn't really work because they simply put his deputy in power and he's still in power. This is Abdurrabu Mansour Hadi. He was voted in in 2012, but he was the only candidate in the election. Not only that, but he didn't really change anything. The, co- the, the military reforms were cosmetic. And of course, he was only voted in for two years. So he's now been in for just over 10 years. It's worth pointing out that the national dialogue in Yemen that the United Nations ran to transition to peace, this ran between 2013 and 2014. This looked really good on the outside. There were 565 delegates from all around Yemen, but they were centrally, although the the mechanisms of the dialogue looked really good online, on the ground, it was a little less clear. Anyway, the dialogue avoided the toughest issues, which were things like how are we going to divide territory, how are we going to divide power, how are we going to divide resources like oil and gas, didn't really discuss that. Eventually, the Houthis objected to a plan to divide Yemen into six regions. This, by the way, was not a plan that had been um, that had been made in the national dialogue. It was made by a hand-picked committee chosen by President Hardy, and it left the Houthis with no access to oil and gas, no access to any coastline or ports. They weren't going to accept it. And at the time, the Houthis were able to ride a general wave of discontent. There had been oil, fuel hikes, petrol hikes, There had been uh, a a very strong sense of corruption, of the elite getting rich. And these were the kinds of tickets that the Houthis rode on as they they marched south, as they took over the capital uh, and then went south, starting in September 2014. So by 2015, the president fled the country and asked the coalition to intervene. So very quickly, think about the main players. I think we can categorize them into three main groups in this war. Each of them is based in a different capital city and each has a different regional backer outside Yemen. So the first block would be the Houthis. These are are the group, uh, basically a political military and increasingly religious grouping from Yemen's north, not a tribe. Um, Houthi is a family name, not a tribal name. And they're backed by Iran. Territory in which about two thirds of Yemen's population lives. So, you know, they can't just be bombed into oblivion and they can't certainly be ignored in any government or power sharing arrangement. They are an integral part of Yemen's future. They were actually at war with the governments for six years between 2004 and 2010 before the current war emerged. But what's interesting is that the game changer that allowed them to sweep to power was not actually Iranian hardware. It was It was the defection of the former president, Ali Abdullah Saleh, who joined with the Houthis, avenge his ouster. And this is significant because it shows that the Houthis are actually very pragmatic, ultimately. Having fought six wars with this former president, they aligned with him as long as it suited them. And when it didn't suit them, from about 2017, when it looked like the former president was negotiating with the other side, they killed him. So we need to be aware that the Houthis are nothing if not pragmatic, even though they have an ideological backbone. Uh, Right. Second player, the internationally recognized government of President Hardy. So technically, they're based in Aden, but most uh, of Herdi, well, his, Herdi and most of his entourage, his close entourage, is still based in Riyadh, in Saudi Arabia. And I think there are serious questions over the legitimacy. As I mentioned, he, his term actually ended officially 
in 2014. And whilst the government claims to hold 80% of territory in the country, two things wrong with that analysis. One is that the territory they're counting is geographical, so quite a lot of it is empty desert. It's not where people live. And secondly, it's not at all clear that the government does hold that territory. It's important to recognise that there's a very big difference between being anti-Houthi and pro-government. They are not the same thing. There are lots of groups that may be anti-Houthi, but it does not mean that they support the government of President Herdy, although they may fight for it on and off while it suits them. And the third player, moving along, the Southern Transitional Council. This group emerged in 2017. It's backed by the United Arab Emirates and it's based in Aden. Now, it is part now of a power sharing government together with the Herdi government, but ultimately still wants a separate southern independent state. And although they signed the Riyadh agreement with the Herdi government, this was an agreement which papered over the cracks between the Southern Transitional Council, the separatists in the South, and the main government, the internationally recognised government of President Herdy. This really is just kicking the can down the road. This really is just trying to stay together long enough to defeat the Houthis, and then they'll go back to their demand of a separate state. So finally, is there an end in sight? Well, as Dr. Saman mentioned, we did have a truce announced at the weekend, which was fantastic, really good news. We have not had a nationwide truce since 2016, and that one lasted a very short time. There was, of course, an agreement signed in Stockholm at the end of 2018 between the warring sides, but there was only a ceasefire for one area, an area called Hodeida. And not only that, but it was marred by hundreds, if not thousands of violations of that ceasefire. So not even that worked. So I guess what I'm trying to say is be, be pleased about this truce, but uh, we shouldn't rely on it. I think the most we can hope for is that this truce lasts for the extent of Ramadan. It's supposed to be for two months, but it's in everyone's interests to put down their weapons during Ramadan, and that this then will allow enough opportunity for the different sides to uh, get together and to, to maybe just talk about some kind of broader political process that could lead to a more sustainable truce. So that's what I'm hoping. Now I've got a lot more to say about the truce, about the prospects for peace, about the warring sides, but I'm gonna hand over to Emile and leave it to all of you to raise the issues you'd like to hear about in the questions. Thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth. And uh, uh, we'll now turn to uh, Emile, who will uh, uh, probably add some new layers of complexity looking at uh, the, the regional geopolitics behind uh, the war. Emile, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Jean-Loup. Uh, Jean uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon to all. Uh, thanks for this opportunity. Um, I'm not a Yemen uh, a specialist per se. I look at it from a regional perspective. So anything that is, you know, about Yemen, send it to uh, Dr. Kendall. Uh, I, I will try to look at, at how regional players uh, uh, intervene in, in this very complex space. Um, so uh, let me start with, with, uh, with this. Um, we're in, in the fall of 2014, and an extremist group is taking over large cities, uh, large swaths of territory, uh, seizing resources, and importantly, uh, uh, you know, large amounts of military hardware. If you are in Western capitals or elsewhere, uh, you would say, okay, Emil has just described ISIS's ex expansion in 2014. If you're sitting in a Gulf capital, you say, that's the Hussis. Um, and, you know, what I'm trying to convey here is that what essentially dominated our view of the Middle East for some years uh, in Western Asian capitals and so on, which was uh, 
the, the, the takeover of this jihadi monster um, is not necessarily the only prism that people look at, uh, or, or, or the main prism that people in the region look at, at regional developments. If you were sitting in Riyadh uh, or Abu Dhabi, uh, for that matter, that's what you remember from 2014, right? And, you know, I don't want to push the parallel too far, but it kind of stands. It kind of uh, um, uh, 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 makes sense. I'm describing it from uh, those uh, those countries' perspective. Uh, Jean-Luc, can I just ask you? Can you remove the map uh, if it's if it's okay? It's just uh, it, yeah, I prefer to see your face. Um, so there is a long context. There is a long history uh, and a very tortuous and convoluted one between Yemen and the Gulf states. Um, for a very long time, Yemen was this you know, this large country, large population, historical role. Uh, Aden had a very important uh, uh, history as a trading hub. Um, it, the, the rest of the Gulf states hadn't uh, um, uh, evolved into, into modern states yet and, and so on. And then uh, you start having the consolidation of states on the Arabian Peninsula, the discovery of oil, and then, in a way, the perception of Yemen changes uh, from being, you know, the, the, the big player on the Arabian Peninsula, uh, although isolated at the tip of it, um, it becomes, uh, you know, the, the weaker one, the poorer one, the one beset with uh, 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 the internal fault lines, some of which uh, Dr. Kendall just uh, just discussed, especially the the north-south one, and the fact that it was never a consolidated state, a highly centralized one. And then over time, Yemen then become, uh, uh, is seen as, as a problem state uh, for the Gulf states, right? Uh, you have uh, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula that seeks refuge there. You have state fragmentation and later collapse. Then you have the rise of the, the Houthis. Then you have you know, large numbers of Yemenis uh, looking for work elsewhere in, in, in the peninsula or becoming refugees, etc. So the narrative on Yemen changes uh, from uh, the middle of the, 19th, uh, the, the 20th century till, uh, till now. And the debate in the Gulf states has always been what to do with Yemen. Do we, do we try to integrate Yemen in some kind of regional system? Um, do we contain and ignore Yemen altogether? Say, you know, this is too big. Let's let's cut ourselves from from that 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 problem, uh, or do we seek to dominate Yemen? Do we need to be uh, to to set its politics so that we we you know we can control this country from within through our partners and 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 so on? So you know, and that debate was never essentially solved uh, in in Gulf capitals. Now, in this presentation, I'm just going to look at Saudi Arabia and the UAE uh, because they are the main players in that. But you know, elsewhere in the region, they've always been uh, uh, thinking about about Yemen, and, and we'll touch certainly on on the role of Oman uh, in in the Q and Q and A. Now, for Saudi, um, Yemen being this large uh, uh, neighboring state, um, the involvement was always deep and and complex, and you know, we've all heard about. The, 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 the rivalries and, and the, how the Saudi state came together in part against Yemen or by eating parts of Yemen. Um, uh, those, those ties were, were very complex. They were political, they were religious, they were economic. Uh, the Yemeni uh, diaspora in Saudi was extremely active, uh, uh, very, very skilled. Uh, some of the names are, are, are well known. Um, but I would argue that uh, starting the, the 2000s with the rise of AQAP, uh, Al-Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula, there's, there's a, there was a change in how Saudi Arabia related to Yemen. It became seen as a counterterrorism problem first and foremost. And so the reservoir of knowledge that was in Saudi Arabia that existed, I mean, the manager of that file at the time was Prince Sultan and, and others. Uh, that the management of that file moved to the, the more security minded uh, um, uh, uh, people, uh, notably um, Hamad Ben Naif, uh, the former uh, interior minister and, and, uh, and crown prince. And uh, these people saw Yemen primarily through a city lens. 
Um, and so their relationships became uh, much more limited. Uh, they worked with Ali Abdullah Saleh, uh, with uh, uh, the intelligence and security forces of Yemen. Um, they didn't pay attention to the rest of Yemeni society uh, the way their predecessors did. I'm not saying that the predecessors did necessarily a very good job at managing that or they were doing the right thing. I'm just saying that uh, the, the, the engagement was much narrower. Uh, which I, I think, you know, um, is, is a reason why the Saudis were quite surprised uh, starting 2011, 2012 uh, at the direction of events in, in Yemen. They stopped understanding the country uh, because they hadn't invested really in, in, in it anymore uh, from a knowledge perspective. So um, to go back on, on the timeline that uh, Dr. Kendall offered, um, in 2011, 2012, the Gulf states felt that uh, you know, given the, the uprising in Yemen and so on, they did their part. They facilitated the transition. They brought uh, they, uh, to Mansour Hadi. They, they pushed Ali Abdullah Saleh out. Um, you know, they put a plan, the GCC transition plan, uh, and then they handed over that hot potato to the UN. Um, and they did disengage from Yemen. And from their view, the UN, um, ended up being naive or incompetent, uh, unable to manage that process. Uh, so it, the failure is not really theirs. It's, it's the Yemenis and, and, and the UN and describing their, their view on that. And so you get to 2014, 2015, and the takeover of, of uh, uh, Yemen, uh, of North Yemen and Sana'a in particular by, by the Hussis. And um, the takeover in particular of the military capabilities of uh, uh, of the Yemeni state or the, the, the main ones, including the missile uh, arsenal. Um, this is no small deal. And all this was happening uh, in a very troubled context for, for the key Gulf states. Syria was on fire, ISIS was rising, the Gulf states had been accused of being uh, complicit or complacent towards ISIS. Um, the the negotiations between the, the great powers in Iran on the nuclear deal were progressing. There was a sense that, uh, you know, the, the, the US in particular was prioritizing this over, over any regional consideration. Uh, the priority was to, to limit Iran's uh, nuclear expansion. Um, there were tensions with the US, pretty, pretty significant ones. And you had this festering problem um, you know, on your uh, southwestern flank. And so the, the 2015 intervention came in that context. It was a way for Saudi Arabia and the UAE to say, we want and we can set the regional agenda. We're not paper tigers. Uh, we have prepared for a moment like that. What was missing in the past was, um, you know, determination and, and courage, and we're showing that we can do it. Um, you know, Early on, the, the campaign was, uh, um, you know, the, this, this was a complex campaign. Um, the Saudis, within a month, claimed that they had destroyed the entire missile uh, uh, arsenal of the Hussis, uh, which wasn't the case. Uh, I'll get to that in a second. Um, but they were able to fly an air campaign like they had never done before. Uh, so that was, like, you know, we'll, we'll discuss how brutal and how effective that was in a second. But you know, that was still an achievement uh, for, from their perspective. And it was a difference uh, from the way they fought the 2009 war, which was a border war uh, without much air power or actually air power not being a, a, the predominant uh, instrument. Um, and the second thing, and importantly, is that the UAE essentially uh, projected uh, its power through um, you know, its, its uh, um, presidential guard, uh, special forces, et cetera. And I would say, you know, purely from a military perspective, a lot of people in, in Western capitals, I remember, and, and elsewhere, were saying they will never be able to, you know, land troops in Aden, that's an amphibious operation, they never did it, and so on. Well, they did it. Again, you know, tactical success, not a strategic one, because uh, it's only once you hit the shores that you realize you have to figure out the local politics and uh, organize your partners and and uh, not just get territory, but uh, you know, secure uh, political loyalties and so on. That's the hard part. Uh, but anyway, you know, there was early on the satisfaction uh, that uh, uh, the the um, uh, you know that 
they did something uh, significant. Now, the problem was with the concept of the operation and, and the application of force. Air power uh, was seen as the main instrument uh, in parallel with uh, working with local partner forces, right? This was what the US was doing at the same time in Iraq and Syria, uh, deploying air power alongside uh, 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 working with uh, local partner force doing most of the fighting. Now for the Gulf states, um, you know, they took satisfaction from um, the fact that the intervention was legal that they went to the Security Council, they got resolution to 216. At least they can say this is illegal intervention. Uh, we came in support of an internationally rec recognized government. So box checked. Then you look at the merits of the intervention. And you know, they say, look, what we're fighting is an armed non-state actors with access to advanced weaponry at our border. How is that different from what Turkey is doing against the PKK or Israel against Hezbollah, right? We it's not necessarily, you know, I mean, we may not like it, but is it that controversial in an age of, of uh, uh, nation states trying to protect themselves? Again, I, I'm trying, I'm describing their, their, their view on that. Uh, then the real question mark, I think for me, is not about legality or even merit. Um, it's about wisdom, uh, knowing what you're getting into uh, and how you're going to, you fight that one but also about strategy and capabilities. I think, you know, the reliance on air power, the, the appeal of air power is very problematic in the region. It makes it seem as if you can win from far away, that you can deploy advanced technology and somehow achieve political effect on the ground. And I think, you know, the, the, the Gulf states are not the only ones who have fallen for that. I mean, you know, there's a long list of them. It's, it helps, I mean, it's understandable why you have all this advanced kit uh, that you can deploy and you don't necessarily have to send your, your boys die uh, uh, in complex operations. You know, you just press a button and things happen. Um, but, you know, as we've learned in a number of conflicts, uh, notably uh, Lebanon uh, in 2006, during the war between Hezbollah and Israel that jean Lou wrote about, air power is, is, is overstated, it's frustrating. Um, and, and it doesn't necessarily deal with the true nature of your, your uh, enemy. Um, in this case, the Hossis, a resilient, uh, tough group that needs very little uh, to, to survive and operate, right? This is, um, uh, this is not a, an advanced fighting force, but it's a committed one, um, and it's a very flexible one. Air, air power certainly wasn't going to be the solution. The other side is, the partners. Well, it turns out that the partners were weak, uh, divided, problematic, uh, and as Dr. Kendall said, lacking legitimacy in the case of Ansar Hadi. Um, so, you know, you, that, that was certainly a huge problem in the intervention. The other uh, problem I would say is that the Saudi rhetoric was maximalist early on, where actually the political position, the real position wasn't as maximalist. So you had uh, uh, Prince Mohammed bin Salman going on television and announcing that if he wanted within a week, that, uh, within a month, that would be in Sana'a, uh, that they destroyed this and that and, uh, and the number of spokespersons for, for the, the campaign. Um, but in reality, it, they, they, they were frustrated. And I would argue that Saudi escalation in Yemen is more, was more about frustration than about strategy. Um, that over time, the recourse to air power and, you know, bombing here and there was more because they know what else to do than because they had a well thought out plan for victory. Now, there's another aspect to the intervention, which is the perspective of the Hossi, the view of the Hossis as a, as a proxy of Iran. Now, the debate here is quite, I would say, complex. You have those uh, in, in, especially in Western countries who say, the Saudis were stupid. Uh, they started the Yemen war and they turned the Houthis uh, uh, into, into partners of Iran. That was a self-fulfilling prophecy. I mean, you know, they, they, they made the thing they feared the most happen. The other view from the Gulf states is to say, well, that was inevitable and we had to try and preempt that. Um, I, I would, my view as an analyst is um, it's closer to the Gulf state on that. I think that we spent too much time understating Hussein ties with Iran um, 
I think that they, they are the real, so they're certainly not as organic or dense as they are with other groups. Uh, but, you know, in a way, I kind of agreed that it was inevitable uh, that uh, they would uh, uh, um, they would come closer, uh, regardless of whether the, the Saudis uh, intervened or, or not. Uh, probably what the Saudi intervention did was to speed up that process and give it a, and, 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 and give, it, give it even more rationale. Anyway, I'm not trying to justify anything. I'm just you know, putting it analytically. Now, let me do, um, let me offer a very imperfect and self-serving analogy uh, here. Like all analogies, uh, there's a reason why I use that. Um, but to make a point about why I, I would argue Saudi objectives in Yemen are not the maximalist ones that uh, we perceive uh, them to be. So I'm going to look at Saudi Arabia in Yemen and compare that to Iran and Syria. Uh, you know, in both cases, uh, the, those governments intervened uh, legally to help another government uh, in trouble uh, at home. So look, let's look at Saudi in Yemen, um, their perspective on, on the um, on, on the rebels, the Hussis here. Um, Saudi Arabia is an enemy of the Hussis, but it is on record saying that the Hussis have to be engaged. It actually has engaged them. Uh, they are on record saying that they have to be part of the future government of, uh, of uh, Yemen. Um, and yes, while sometimes the rhetoric is, was scary, they're all terrorists and you know all this, these extreme ones, um, the reality is that they engage them or they try to, and they've met them and so on. Iran and Syria considers all the rebels, uh, all the opposition to be jihadis, uh, not worth talking to, just destroying and so on. There is no attempt at political engagement there. Syria in, in uh, sorry, Saudi in, uh, in Yemen uh, realizes how weak and problematic uh, uh, Mansour Hadi is. In fact, they see him as part of the problem. The, pro the issue is that they don't know how to uh, 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 deal with that. So they're actually hoping that a political process can start um, so that actually they can think about uh, a, a replacement for, for Mansour Hadi, understanding that he's not the partner that they had hoped he would be. Iran and Syria consider Assad to be untouchable. You know, he's not a subject for negotiation. Uh, Syria in, uh, Saudi Arabia in, in Yemen, um, has one political process. Actually, it has another one now that they, they convene those parties in, uh, in, in Riyadh. But for like eight years, uh, seven years, um, it was mostly through the UN process. The Saudis didn't have a separate uh, truck um, and they were engaged in that one. Iran and Syria considers the UN process useless. They don't care about Geneva. It's, it's all a sideshow. That's not where the real stuff is happening. Saudi Arabia and Yemen, is, is okay, has made its peace with the fact that Yemen may have to be a federal state or a decentralized state. You know, it will be governed differently um, in, in an ideal world. Iran in, in uh, Syria um, refuses uh, to consider any decentralization. It only wants a strong central uh, government headed by, by Assad. Saudi Arabia uh, in Yemen, um, has already put some money, certainly not enough, given uh, the extent of the damage it is responsible for, but into reconstruction and humanitarian assistance. Uh, of course, that aid is targeted uh, primarily to its own partners. Um, uh, and certainly we're hoping, I mean, not hoping, we're expecting, and certainly we will be demanding that Saudi Arabia, if there's a political settlement, uh, sign this very large check to help Yemen rebuild uh, its infrastructure, uh, whether it's physical or, or other. There's no such expectation of Iran and Syria. Um, you know, Iran and Syria doesn't put a dollar in, in, in reconstruction and assistance. Um, and finally, um, when it comes to Saudi in Yemen, we have a sense of the leverage that the international community can use to force Saudi hand. There is political leverage. There is reputational damage that can be leveraged. There is military assistance that can be cut off, uh, etc. Right. When it comes to Iran and Syria, we have no idea how to build that leverage. And actually, we gave up. We basically said, "Can anyway." None of this is to suggest that 
uh, you know, one intervention is okay and the other one is not. I, that's not the point. The point is to say that the Saudi position in Yemen is not as maximalist as it, it seems to be at times. Now, the key question for, the, for Saudi Arabia and the UAE has been uh, a very frustrating one, how to build leverage against the Houthis. And they've tried everything. They tried total war with a blockade. They tried international pressure. They tried peace talks, whether through the UN or now through the GCC in Kuwait in 2016 and, and uh, Stockholm in 2018, etc. right? And that hasn't worked. Uh, they tried bilateral engagement. Uh, there are you know, meetings in person, also, but also lots of WhatsApp discussions between Saudi and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Hussi officials. That too hasn't worked. And they've tried to go through Iran. Uh, the, the reason for the discussions that took place for nine months between Saudi Arabia and, um, uh, and Iran in Baghdad uh, was primarily about Yemen, and that didn't work. So they don't have a sense of how that, to develop that, that leverage. And that intervention has therefore be become very frustrating for them. Frustration with the military setbacks, plenty of them. Frustration with the UN, uh, you know, questions about UN strategy, uh, you know, whether you go for a nationwide ceasefire or local ceasefire, uh, the Stockholm Agreement or the Hadid Agreement 2018 was hailed as a big success. Uh, well, it turns out that it wasn't so big a success. And because it was a localized ceasefire, it allowed Houthis to redirect their forces to elsewhere, uh, other valuable territory. Um, they had to deal with the frustration with divided partners, you know, who are fighting each other, are not, you know, focusing on, on the main enemy uh, from their perspective, the Houthis. Um, over time, you had the development of different perspectives between Saudi and the UAE, um, to what extent to uh, intervene in Yemen, what really matters. The UAE is much more focused on, on the coastal regions, uh, while Saudi Arabia is focused on the hinterland. Saudi is a lot more vulnerable to Hussein attacks, while the UAE for a long time wasn't. Now this may be changing. Uh, also dealing with the reputational cost that has affected uh, um, especially Saudi Arabia's uh, uh, perception in, in many countries, uh, and the political tensions uh, with Western partners. Importantly, you had the growth in Hussein ballistic and UAV arsenal and the attacks that have followed. And this has exposed the vulnerability of the Gulf states uh, to a, what was considered a small armed non-state actor. Suddenly, uh, they can threaten airports, they can fire missiles or use drones uh, while Formula One is happening in Jeddah. This is, this is embarrassing. This is, this is not what you, you what, while you have this uh, narrative of modernization and progress happening, this is a reminder that you have very troubled uh, 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 border. Um, and, and it questions, you know, a lot of the strategic choices they made in the past on air defense, you know, does it work, does it not work, is defense alone, you know, all these sophisticated systems alone. So um, just to uh, conclude, I know I went over time, but um, um, in, you know, there was a sense in 2021 that this was the year where Yemen would have priority, um, you know, Saudi was exhausted. Uh, there was a Biden administration that had made it a priority uh, and also wanted to focus on the JCPOA uh, that, and, and that the reputational and, and uh, costs and the military frustrations for Saudi um, and the UAE disengagement uh, were, um, uh, uh, you know, all combined to prepare a ground for, for a escalation or perhaps a political process. Well, not so. We always forget that the other side has a vote. And I think uh, the Hussis. Um, are um, an expansionist group. They went. They saw a moment of weakness on the other side. Uh, they want to secure those oil resources in in the east in Maghreb. Uh, they 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 just they're pressing. Their, they they sought to press their advantage. And the Iranians, who some people had expected to be a bit more uh, um, accommodating, uh, because of the nuclear diplomacy, because of a number of things, turned out that they not really. Uh, you know, they, they, they won't stand in the way of one of their key partners achieving uh, strategic gains. Um, so, you know, we enter 2022 with, uh, you know, um, a much more sober view of what can be achieved in Yemen after some euphoria in 2021, especially on Capitol Hill in the US. 
Um, and uh, I would argue we're nowhere close to a conclusion uh, on, on this. Um, you know, the this, this ceasefire, well, while welcome, especially during Ramadan, uh, Yemeni families have the right to uh, breeze a little bit and, and not have to worry about things flying in their houses from the air or, or bullets and so on. It, there's no political foundation that I see um, for, uh, for a sustained political dialogue. Uh, but then again, I'm Middle Easterner studying the Middle East, so you know I cannot help but being pessimistic. I, I'll stop here. I, there's plenty of other things to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emil, and thank you for uh, ending on a pessimistic note, uh, which is a, a classic of any discussion on the, the region. Uh, as uh, uh, I'll uh, inform our participants, if you'd like to ask a question, please send your question to the Middle East, uh, to the MEI events account, who will uh, gather uh, all the questions. Uh, let me start with one question, or which is more like a, a comment to test an analogy here, because uh, for those who are not familiar with uh, what's going on in Yemen, uh, a lot of what you describe, both of you, could sound similar to what we've seen over the last year in Afghanistan. The idea that you have maximalist, maximalist goals uh, uh, for a long time, Saudi Arabia uh, rejecting the idea of having to coexist with the Houthis, and at the same time, the military operations not reaching any breakthrough. Do you feel like eventually, because there isn't a, a a strong alternative because there are flaws with the legitimate government or the not so legitimate government of Mr. Hadi that eventually at a certain point, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, the Gulf as a whole will have to coexist with the Houthis the same way we had to uh, realize that the Taliban were back in Afghanistan. So just trying to see how this analogy works or not uh, with you. Who would like to start uh, here? Well, I mean, I'm happy to give a very brief comment on that, but yes, definitely. The Houthis will have to be a part of the coexistence in Yemen. There's no question about that at all. What's really worrying, however, and quite appropriate for your Afghanistan analogy is that over the past seven and a bit years that this war has been going on, the Houthis have become increasingly supremacist and increasingly reluctant to, um, let's say, to work with women or to have any, any kind of inclusive approach to government. So it's gonna be really difficult, uh, but I don't, th th there's, no, there's no way they can be excluded from government. And I, I think it's important to point out they are not just an ideological religious group. You know, they are more than that. Uh, although I guess the marriage of the political with the religious is pretty symbolic in their name, in their, the name of their political arm, Ansar Allah. So that, that kind of shows you how intertwined it is. But no, we're going to all have to work with the Houthis, like it or not. Yeah, I mean, if I can add quickly, I mean, look, in in Gulf capitals as well, there is a recognition that you can't destroy that movement. You can't even really defeat it. You can actually, at best, you can force it to um, deal with others. Uh, now, the problem is, you know, as, as Dr. Kendall just mentioned, um, this is a... Um, at this point, it is a hegemonic movement. It, you know, it seeks to be the, the dominant force across Yemen. Now, I don't know Yemen that well, but I do know that it's a, it's a diverse society, uh, that there you'll have a lot of pushback, um, that the Hussis themselves are not necessarily the most popular, including in the regions they control, uh, that they struggle to provide, you know, governance and services and, and others because you know, they're still a, a, an expansionist revolutionary movement. Um, they're not, uh, uh, you know, it's not that they, they stopped and thought, okay, uh, 
how do we really improve the lot of, of the Yemenis who are loyal or not to us? That's not the consideration at the moment. The, consider the key consider consideration is to, to survive and, and, and to win, or at least defeat any existential challenge to them. Um, the, the question for me is from the perspective, not just of regional state and the international community, is there a, a strategic and moral case for preventing the Hussis from achieving that kind of, of control domination over that space. I think this is, you know, we, we have to be honest about that. Are we, are we, would we be, not we, I mean, would the international community, key actors, etc., be satisfied or be okay with um, the Hussis taking over Maghreb um, and achieving that kind, I mean, because that I suspect, I don't know if, if uh, Elizabeth agree with me, but, you know, that essentially would end a major chapter uh, of, of, this, uh, of this conflict. Um, it will still remain violent, uh, but, you know, Maghreb, it was the place where, you know, the, the opponents of, of the Hussis could still operate where there was a semblance of uh, central government or internationally recognized government, you know, authority and so on. That gone, then you, you're, you know, it, it, it's going to transform the battlefield. The other thing I would say is, well, you know, we can agree um, analytically and, and among officials that there is no military uh, victory um, in, in Yemen, at least um, uh, this is not a sentiment shared by the Hussis. You know, that's the big issue is that, you know, you just described Afghanistan. Um, you know, the Taliban never, you know, their officials never went on, you know, on television and say, there is no military solution to that conflict. I mean, you know, this is probably one of the most stupid sentences uh, uttered by diplomats and others. Sorry, I just have to lash out. You know, John Kerry used to go and on television and say, there's no military solution in Syria. Well, there was one, right? It really depends on the commitment, the willingness to, to the, the, the cost that one is willing to pay for it, the cost that one is willing to impose on the others and so on. And that's really the, the question right now, right? It, it is like, because one side is so determined and the other is weaker, does, does that still mean that we should allow the determined side to have its way? And then once this is done, because that's the, the real trick, like we see in Afghanistan, the size of the humanitarian challenge is going to be so big that you know, it will be for others, including enemies of that group, to go and subsidize or support that society and that government, which is you know, the, 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 one of the dilemmas faced in Afghanistan right now with the sanctions and so on. So you know, these are not easy questions to deal with. As much as you know, we, we have to be critical of the Saudi intervention, we also have to ask the other questions about what the Yemen under Husi rule, or at least the, you know, the northern part, large part, the rich part, uh, looks like. Thank you. And actually, uh, I have a, a flow of other not easy questions coming to you. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll ask uh, uh, two questions uh, in a row uh, to, uh, to allow for more time uh, with the, the others. Uh, first question from Asif Shuja, uh, who's, a, who's a, a senior research fellow here at the Middle East Institute, who asked about the, the role of the UN, United Nations in particular, the special envoy uh, Mr. Hans Grundberg, uh, and he's asking, in the end, I mean, if we go back to the question of can Gulf states end the war in Yemen, is, is it the problem that they cannot end uh, the war by themselves and that the UN has uh, to take uh, leadership here? Uh, so that would be uh, the first question. Another question uh, we have from Gadel, who's uh, asking about the recent Houthi attacks on Abu Dhabi uh, in the last uh, two months. Uh, do you see this attacks as a clear um, game changer or as a turning point in the way the UAE uh, engaged uh, in the, the war in Yemen? Do you see specifically on the Arab coalition a change in the uh, Emirati policy? So let's start with these uh, two questions. Um, who would like to start this time? Should we start first with Emil this time? Thank you. I think that does an order. Um, yes, uh, the, the role of the UN. I mean, look, the, 
the Gulf states understand their their limitations. Um, they they um, and actually they welcome the role of the UN uh, in part because um, you know those processes are very complex. They don't necessarily have the 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 patience, the 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 the, the diplomatic bench, uh, and so on to sustain them. The other thing is that they're keen on making Yemen an international concern than just their, uh, 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 their problem, right? They want to multilateralize all this. Uh, they haven't, I mean, to the extent possible, they've always tried to, to engage uh, other countries, uh, you know, especially Western ones in this. In part is to say, look, we're nice guys and, you know, you, you criticize us for our campaign and so on, but we're trying diplomatically and we're not, undercutting you and and we only have the un process and so on so you know it is self-serving to some extent but i also think it, it's genuine they they just they just want you know they they know they don't have a magical solution and so they expect perhaps others to have one which is not going to be the case obviously they um you know elizabeth would know but this is what the fourth or fifth uh, un special uh, envoy for yemen um you know I, exactly Ben Omar, uh, I forgot uh, the name of the Mauritanian uh, one, the longest serving, then Martin Griffiths, and, and then this guy. Um, so, you know, in a way, it's like, you know, can we offload that problem? But it's not actually a problem that you can offload, right? Uh, you, you, you have to stay engaged and so on. So I, I, they're also very keen, and that's where the real issue is. They're very keen on having their intervention stay legal. Uh, so they want the Security Council imprimatur, right? So 2216 in 2015 was very important for them. Uh, you know, whether it's the intervention, the blockade, everything. Um, the other aspect is, uh, and, and this is, explains also the, the vote in February, right? I mean, uh, this, this critical point where the UAE abstained uh, on the Ukraine uh, 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 resolution, uh, in part because it needed Russian acquiescence for the upcoming vote on Yemen. So th they never want to be uh, against international legality uh, on, on this front. We can debate whether 2216 is the right, uh, um, uh, is, is, is still a relevant framework. I would argue it's not, but you know they're attached to that. Uh, on the Husi attacks against uh, Abu Dhabi, it's not a turning point, but um, but it it is certainly a a um, uh, wake up call for the UAE um, in the sense that uh, they thought they had calibrated their intervention in Yemen for long in uh, uh, in a way that didn't require the Husis or didn't lead the Husis to hit them, and then it happened. So suddenly, you know, you're thinking about your level of involvement in Yemen, uh, your defenses, whether you actually have to fly uh, air operations to destroy those launchers, preempt them. I mean, this is where the discussion is, is right now. Um, I think in the UAE, like in Saudi, there is a determination not to let the Hussis um, take Ma'arib or, or move further, uh, uh, further northeast. Um, I think at this point they've abandoned uh, the hope uh, that they can help their partners take Sana'a or other large uh, uh, urban centers, uh, but they're not going to allow that. So they see their current involvement as essentially holding the line, defensive, rather than being uh, being offensive. Um, yeah, so I'll stop here. Uh, I'll, I'll just quickly wade in um, on those two questions. The first one on UN leadership in mediating a peace. You see, it, I would definitely focus on the word mediation rather than leadership. It does require that's not involved directly in the war to be able to shuttle between the various sides and mediate. And the UN can play that role. I don't think it's been done particularly well by the UN, except I, I think this latest envoy, Hans Grunberg, um, perhaps has perhaps has a bit more of a handle on this. Um, I think it's important that he's Swedish 
and certainly the previous one British was was pretty difficult uh, with all our bag our colonial baggage and arms sales etc having a Swedish one certainly helps and he also had had quite a strong background in Yemen already uh, so it's not learning on the job um, and, and I think you know, it's significant that he's pulled off this truce whether or not it lasts this is definitely something that that was needed and it's much broader in scope than the Hodeida one so I you know I'm still optimistic but I'm pretty cautious over that optimism and then and I think it's Anne Gadel it's her question um say that the who's the attacks on the UAE I think the word she used was game changer and, and I think they probably were and and the reason I say that is is that quite soon after attacks on the UAE the UAE backed giants brigades forces kind of return to their barracks um, they didn't sweep all the way in to actually take Ma'rib although the Houthis were pushed back they they sort of slunk back a bit and I think there might have been some kind of rapprochement reached as in we're not we can now see that even though we've pulled out we, the UAE, have pulled out most of our forces from Yemen, our own forces. Actually, there is a perception that those forces we recruited and we've left on the ground are our responsibility. And, uh, and we'd rather not have the consequences of that. So I, I think also this is a reason why the current truce it was, was possible now. And there were some quite big concessions in that truce, the opening of Sana'a Airport to commercial flights, the opening of Hodeida Port to fuel ships, things that really weren't conceivable a couple of months ago. That's it. Thank you very much. Uh, so next question, so I have one question from Elisha asking, uh, can the Houthis succeed as a political party? Uh, so basically, uh, if you look at how they achieved military legitimacy through territorial expansion, how can you see that transforming them into an effective political party? Uh, I, the way I understand it is, uh, how can you see the, the Houthis basically becoming uh, a legitimate, uh, even more maybe a responsible political actor uh, inside Yemen? Uh, another question uh, from Laura Maisa, who's asking, uh, uh, who's mentioning a report uh, from uh, the International Crisis Group uh, from uh, earlier this year. Uh, I think this was the, the report from January, uh, brokering a ceasefire in Yemen's economic conflict. Uh, the, the argument was that the Yemen, Yemeni war is an economic war and that sidelining this issue would only make any truth short term. What is your view on that? Should that be considered as a priority to reach an agreement between the warring parties? And what could be the position of their regional backers uh, on that? So it's a, a three uh, layers question. Um, let's, uh, let's start uh, this time with uh, Elizabeth. Sure, could we imagine the Houthis as a responsible political party? Well, it is quite difficult to imagine. Um, but it is necessary. And I think the main point here, and one that we've done really badly so far, is that we need to start promoting the moderates and sidelining side the hardliners. And thus far, we've really done the opposite. Many of the policies, um, including the foreign terrorist organization uh, designation that Trump brought in and was quickly outed again, and some of the drone strikes that have targeted Houthi leaders, what we've been doing is getting rid of the moderates and helping to confirm the rhetoric of the hardliners. So with a switch, I mean, I think that I think we would have a little more hope. On the question about the economy, the International Crisis Group report, I thought that was an excellent report. And and it is ignored. Now, I don't think that the economy is the key, the entire key to the war, but certainly removing some of the economic incentives that drive the war would be really helpful. 
And there's no question that many of the elites get rich on the back of the war. And these are the same elites who we're trying to ask to get round a table to end the war. So there's definitely a conflict of interest there. Um, but on the economy side, I also want to add one further point, which is that it's very unhelpful to have uh, regional states, regional players pumping in a lot of money to buy support in Yemen because it skews the economy and it's also an incentive for the war. When you're trying to, I mean, we call it patronage, but you're trying to buy tribal support or um, the problem with that is that you, the other side is trying to buy the same support and we quite often find you know, malicious signing up with all of the sides. Uh, and, and so that's definitely unhelpful. Um, and then the third thing is, is investment in livelihoods, in alternatives to joining militias, to the fighting. Now, we need it now, so that you know, if peace is agreed, if this truce does continue, people have other jobs they can go to, that there's an economy that, that, that's there that's not just reliant on war. Now, I know that sounds quite idealistic, but I, I, I really believe that's possible. Okay, over to you, Emil. Um, thank you. Uh, I, I certainly on on the economic uh, uh, piece, I can't uh, uh, provide much. Um, you know, I'm interested in war economies. I see the arguments that that Elizabeth what is 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 making. Uh, it's just you know the the incentives and the uh, that you know uh, that are created uh, in such environments. I mean, we know they they fuel conflict in places. They sometimes fuel. Uh, bizarre types of coordination in in others we we saw that uh, across the board certainly in in geographies i know better like uh, no, no, uh, syria and so on i mean we've had quite unlikely uh, cooperation um just to you know that maintain the war economy uh, going um and it it did come at the cost of um you know the the more normal economy um you know, in both cases, oil uh, being a key key driver, but also taxation and uh, and uh, you know, uh, taxation on 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 pretty much everything, including movement of people and so on. Anyway, on the first point, which is you know more of uh, 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 you know falls more within my my expertise, there's a big debate uh, about whether those resistance movements. Uh, you know, those can transform into, into uh, uh, governance actors. Um, it's difficult to, uh, to have a, 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 a complete answer to that. Uh, very often these groups don't want that responsibility. Uh, they prefer to have a foot inside and a foot outside. Um, they're hybrid actors. Uh, you know, I mean, very interestingly, uh, Hezbollah, the Lebanese uh, Shia military group that, you know, served as a mentor in a way to the Hussis, um, not in every way, but in, in certainly in, 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 in some, uh, look, not, doesn't necessarily want to replicate, and I suspect had tense discussions with the Hussis about their strategy. Hezbollah doesn't want to dominate Lebanon because it doesn't want to take on the responsibility of governance. It wants to focus on its day job, which is resistance, uh, deterrence, uh, you know, mobilization, and so on. You know, let's keep, let's have others, including enemies, um, run uh, the the country. I mean, run run it to the ground in this case. But um, that's not that's not really uh, what they what they want to prioritize. Um, the Hussis, like Hamas, uh, by the way, they. They wanted the responsibility to take on the state. They wanted the legitimacy that came with it. They um, now perhaps they want to do both. They want to govern and they want to resist at the same time, which is really hard because it becomes easier for your enemy to hit you. And then if you're associated with the state, then then all of the state is fair game for your enemy. At least that's the perception um, because it takes time and attention and it's complex and you have to make local compromises and that uh, you have to keep the bureaucracy going it's not as sexy as as resisting right um so that has an impact on the ethos of these these movements now where i would disagree with elizabeth is this moderate versus hardliner 
um, uh, uh, dichotomy. Uh, yes, I agree that there is a range of views within those movements, uh, but but I don't buy into the moderate versus hardliner divide, and I certainly don't think external actors can actually leverage those differences much. Um, uh, again, I'm reasoning by analogy, uh, but I've heard the moderate versus hardliner way too often when it comes to Hezbollah or other groups. Uh, and in fact, um, the reality in, in these groups, uh, those who really hold dominant influence are the dark security guys uh, who can use coercion or the threat of coercion and so on to get their way. Uh, we've seen uh, over and over again, even though they're not necessarily the most popular ones in within their movement, they are um, they are the dominant ones. Um, and you know, outsiders very rarely have tools uh, to to. I mean, first, it's very difficult to understand those those fault lines when they exist, navigate them, understand how to amplify them or play them, and so on. That's that's really really hard. Um, now, you, you know, I mean, I don't know if really the 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 Trump administration's designation of the Hossis as a foreign terrorist organization really played that much internally. Uh, you know, I mean, I think it in a way it's it's irrelevant. Uh, it, it it was a and the lifting, by the way, as well was as problematic, I would say, as the designation. I'm not saying the designation was. I mean, it was certainly a political stunt. I think the lifting was also a political stunt um, that actually had detrimental goals uh, because of what it signaled in terms of the, the Biden administration view on uh, on Yemen. Um, so I, I don't know how you, you play that one. I think first and foremost, uh, what matters is shaping battlefield dynamics. Um, if there is a will, if there is no will, uh, then, you know, we go back to the question of that I was asking before is, are we comfortable with um, a, a takeover of, of Yemen by, uh, by the Hossis. Um, you know, just one point that I wanted to, to make earlier, forgot. You have to realize that many countries that are dissatisfied, and that's putting it uh, politely, with the Saudi intervention, still don't want the Hossis to win, right? I mean, the, in a number of Western countries, they're like, no, you know, having an armed non-state actors with ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, uh, uh, drone boats, and other things sitting on Babel Mandeb, this is not good. Um, you know, so part of the reluctance to criticize or sub Saudi is actually in part because they actually want someone to put a check on that that group. You know, and if Saudi is willing to do it, well, it's not doing a good job at it, and only. Uh, in 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 pretty brutal way, uh, but it still achieves you know a strategic uh, uh, effect in 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 this sense. Uh, we can debate the wisdom of that calculation as well. Thank you very much to both of you. We have uh, two other questions. Uh, the first one from uh, uh, Nadia Hassan, who's asking uh, about the, the recent uh, attacks from the Houthis that you you both mentioned. Uh, either on facilities in the UAE or Saudi Arabia, and how does I mean how does this wave of attacks complicate the future trajectory of the Yemen war? And do you see these attacks as uh, bringing uh, the Emiratis and the Saudis uh, towards more a hardline uh, stance against the Houthis? Uh, all the questions coming from uh, George Zakaria, who's asking first. Would the nuclear deal with Iran change its engagement? And uh, we uh, we didn't yet uh, discuss the, uh, the 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 link between the, the Yemen war and uh, the potential nuclear deal with Iran. So that's a, a good a good uh, question to ask. Uh, what how does that change the engagement? And the second part of the question is also uh, what might uh, be a withdrawal with honor for the UAE and uh, Saudi Arabia. So basically, uh, how do you see uh, um, exit strategy, uh, uh, saving dignity? Uh, I think that was Kissinger's uh, expression for Vietnam. So uh, uh, how do you see that happening for the UAE and Saudi Arabia in, uh, in Yemen? So over to you, uh, I guess, uh, uh, I forgot this time. I think this is Emil, yes. Uh, okay. Um, so. 
you know, I, I looking at the paper, I'm finishing at the moment, uh, and I, we tried uh, through our sources and other compilations to count how many attacks have happened against Saudi territory between 2016 and 2021. And according to my count uh, at the moment, we've had over 350 ballistic and cruise missile attacks against Saudi, over 500 UAV attacks. I mean, some of them can be you know, pretty rudimentary. I don't want to suggest that all of them were events one. Uh, over 50 drone boat attacks, and then 90,000 attacks with other projectiles, um, you know, including uh, uh, rockets and uh, you know, artillery rounds and, and so on. So that's a pretty significant uh, uh, number. I mean, and that's since 2015. Look, those attacks are um, are hugely problematic at at many levels. I mean, first, uh, they endanger your population and your territory. Um, they um, they are embarrassing, if not humiliating, at times. Uh, one of the arguments uh, for waging such wars, and we're familiar because it's not just in, in this case that uh, the argument has been deployed, is that you have to fight there so you don't have to fight them here, right? And then suddenly they're here. Um, and so, you know, that's that's also, uh, uh, you know, a, a problem, not just in terms of narrative, but also in terms of how the state presents itself, right, as, as the, the protector and so on. At the same time, the the way the the Hussis have used those attacks, the fact that um, they've often went against civilian uh, targets or infrastructure such as you know oil facilities or ports or uh, uh, sorry airports and so on, um, you know all this has served to tell to to help Saudi say look we're playing defense you know that that uh, you know this is an illegitimate illegal group uh, and look how they're behaving. And therefore, they, like the UAE, want uh, um, to be recognized as a, as a terrorist movement because it's a non-state actor, uh, you know, conducting, you know, transnational attacks against civilian, uh, some, I mean, sometimes military targets, but often not military targets. Um, I would argue that, you know, if you're the Hussis, that is, you know, your perhaps main way of not just showing that you're resilient and standing and so on, but as, as Elizabeth uh, uh, mentioned earlier, uh, get them to agree to concessions because they the, 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 the cost they pay reputationally, domestically, in terms of their economic agendas and so on is quite high. Um, you know, the UAE really doesn't want those attacks happening against uh, its airports and so on. They depend on tourism. They depend on international business and trade and, and saying, and their image uh, is, is key to, to their success, their narrative. Um, so, you know, it, if you're the Hussis, you're going to use that tool, but you have to calibrate it well. In the case of Saudi, I think it's in essentially all out. It doesn't matter. In the case of the UAE, you can still fine tune that. It's early enough that you can play politically, psychologically, et cetera, with, with, the, with the other side. Uh, on the JCPOA, uh, I would argue that we're probably in as bad or worse position as in 2015 today. Um, the, the tensions between the, the US and the uh, Saudi and the UAE when it comes to Iran are as bad as they were back then. And the US is doing as bad, if not worse a job today as it did in 2015 at reassuring or at least you know, preparing their, their, their allies uh, their regional partners about about the consequences of that. So, regardless of what the Americans really want or intend, I think that the a, a, a revived JCPOA is only going to validate the the worst fears and prejudices uh, that the Gulf states have towards the U.S. and what is perceived as a U.S. readiness to accommodate Iran. And this whole debate over you know, for instance, the listing of the uh, IRGC as a foreign terrorist organization is part of that. Of course, again, that's a political stunt. The listing of the, uh, the IRGC was a political stunt when the Trump administration did it. And the delisting by the Trump, uh, the, by the Biden administration will also be a political stunt. I mean, let's be honest, just like the, the Hussein, it's not a materially significant one because the sanctions, all, all the other sanctions exist and it's not going to lead the US to engage with them necessarily differently and so on. There are other reasons for that. 
But given the context, I think that it's just going to make things worse. And we saw that Iran-Saudi uh, dialogue has been interrupted at this point. And I think that's because of what happened in, in January, February in terms of the, the attacks, uh, but also the, the concern about this, this new JCPOA. Look, finally, I would say the problem for the Gulf states, I think, at this point is given their frustration and given the fact that the US also blundered in 2021, uh, thinking that Yemen was a low-hanging fruit that, uh, you know, between Iran-Saudi negotiations and the Biden administration and, and so on, perhaps some progress can be made there on the political track. I'm not talking about the ceasefire. There's an expectation in the Gulf states that Washington has no choice but to help them again militarily. And my point is, what is the concept? You know, what for what? Uh, is it just the defense of Ma'arib? That's not very controversial uh, anyway. But is it more than that? Um, then that becomes more controversial. All right. I'll just give a quick answer to each of those tricky questions. Um, so Nadia Hassan on will the attacks, will the recent attacks make the Houthis, sorry, will, will they make the coalition more hardline? The recent Houthi attacks on UAE, etc. Well, I, I think um, Emil has answered has answered that pretty well. My view is that it it agrees with him. It's basically that I don't think it will make them more hardline. I think it will make them more inclined to negotiate or at least to to give up a little more because at this point, what Saudi Arabia and the UAE want is for this problem to go away. Um, it hasn't been solved. Let's just do what it takes to make it go away because now it's impacting us within our own borders. Uh, and that's really something we don't want because we have a reputation to uphold. We have, we're have we a safe haven for foreign investment. We have business hubs, regional hubs out here in our countries, and we don't want to jeopardize that. This is now too much to lose. So I think the opposite. What does this all with honor look like? Well. Uh, I think it looks like a power sharing government. I think that would now be acceptable. If they could get together a power sharing government that, that all the different sides have agreed on, then we can just get out. Um, now, of course, that's that's going to be tricky, but, but I don't think it's entirely impossible. And what it would require is probably a, a, a bit of a reinterpretation not necessarily an entire rewriting, but a reinterpretation of the UN Security Council Resolution 2216, which stipulated that the Houthis, I mean, in short, the Houthis need to put down all their weapons and go back to their northern strongholds. I, I don't think that will happen, but there's a little bit of flexibility in that resolution. It, 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 could, it could work out in that way. All right, finished. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. And uh, we have uh, about five minutes left. Uh, let me use the, the privilege of being the, uh, the moderator to ask you about the role of uh, uh, global powers. And uh, we, we already uh, discuss how the US uh, has, has been reducing its, uh, uh, its uh, support to the coalition. And that, that has been uh, very explicit uh, in the, the way the, the Biden administration has been, talk, has been talking about the Yemen war over the last two years. Uh, we didn't mention about the role of Russia and also about China in uh, the Yemen war. This might be a, a limited role, but there have been talks about uh, Russia's playing a role and also uh, China's uh, economic presence uh, in inside Yemen. Uh, could you say a few words maybe on that and if it, if it turns into a, some kind of a proper strategy on each of these countries uh, inside the country, inside Yemen? Thank you. We, I, I, should we start with uh, Elizabeth this time? Sorry. Yeah, thank you. I, I think it's it's very hard to understand exactly what Russia's role is in Yemen. Um, I mean, if you want, if you want to read someone who who does investigate this and tries to unravel it, it's Samuel Romani. I think he he, he works on this. So so take a look for his work. 
He's also done a very good podcast on Russia's role in the Middle East, including Yemen for something called the Arab Digest, if I just give that a, a shout out as well. Um, but clearly R Russia has spoken to all of the different groups in Yemen, but perhaps more so to the Houthi side to and, and to the Southern Transitional Council who also made trips to Moscow. Um, I mean, there's a further interesting trajectory here that hasn't really hit the news in any way, which is that I didn't mention it in, in my overall summary because it, it, it wasn't one of the three main players. But there is a fourth actor in Yemen, which is the, uh, let me get this right, the, the Salvation Council, the National Salvation Council for the South would be the translation of it. This is a fourth player, and it's backed or was backed by Oman, possibly by Qatar as well. And it was launched in October 2019 in the eastern capital of Al Raida. Now, this is against UAE intervention in Yemen, it's against the Saudi so called occupation of the east of Yemen, and it has. It definitely has some uh, inroads with, as, as I suppose it should, if it wants ultimately peace with the Houthis. But interestingly, in the planning meetings for that council, the Russians were present. Uh, Bogdanov was, was there. So I, I, I don't know what the overarching strategy is, but I would say that its fingers are in the pie. Um, perhaps, I'll, perhaps I'll leave the awkward China question for Emil. <laughs> I can't. I can't really answer the the China uh, uh, question either. As I suspect, if there are economic interests, they're they're limited, and you know, it's it, perhaps a long term Chinese view at at connectivity networks. Perhaps in in the future, with with Yemen uh, having you know, uh, Aden could possibly another port in the future, and so on. I, I'm I'm speculating. I don't know enough about that. Uh, I think there was some in interest in, in oil fields as well, but again, I, not not uh, very knowledgeable about this. On, on Russia, however, I would say Yemen was a way for Russia to be present in an area where Saudi and the UAE were, especially in 2014, 15, 16, where these countries were at loggerheads over Syria and other things. And so what you did have you know, from 2216, in the UN resolution 2216, Russia abstained. Had Russia vetoed that, uh, you know, the, the, the intervention would have been illegal under UN Security Council terms, right? Uh, under UN uh, 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 terms. Uh, and that's an, a, an outcome that the Gulf states wanted to avoid. So they, they are entangled with Russia um, in, in complex ways. That's just one of them. Um, the other thing, uh, the other aspect is um, Russia is, is uh, an, or at least tried to present itself as an enemy to no one, but it means that it's a friend to no one. Um, we we some over, often overestimate what Russia does or can do. It's not that they're pouring massive resources. Everyone pays a visit to Moscow, but they come back with like, I mean, what, you're going to have, you know, Warner Group orcs fighting in, in Yemen. I mean, you know, like, it's it, it just there is no clear deliverable from the Russian side. You just you just want the Russians not to oppose you at the Security Council. You just don't you just don't want you want the Russian media not to go after you to inflame the situation. You don't want the Russian media to accuse you of being an ISIS supporter, or whatever. Like this is it was mostly about managing uh, uh, Moscow. Uh, the Hussis themselves never really relied on 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 Russia. Their primary provider, external provider, is uh, um, is uh, Iran. That won't change. Uh, the the Russians didn't want to have their fingerprint on anything that was fired from Yemen against Saudi Arabia because they didn't want to inflame relations on that. So I think it's not it's not such a central actor. It's just in our heads because we see the competition across the region. Uh, we sometimes give Russia a bigger role than is than is warranted. Uh, of course, there are historical relations for Russia, uh, reason for Russia to be uh, present. I mean, you know, southern Yemen used to be an ally of of, uh, of uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, you have lots of Russians who studied Arabic in, in Yemen and, and so on. So it, I'm not saying there's no 
uh, a substance to the relationships. Just it wasn't a central actor. Thank you very much, and, and thank you uh, for both of you. Uh, on behalf of the, the Middle East Institute, uh, uh, please let me thank you uh, for uh, this uh, great uh, discussion. Uh, you you help us uh, today to unpack all the different issues related uh, to the war in Yemen. Let me thank also the participants that uh, stayed with us until the end. Uh, I hope it, it was uh, also very helpful for the uh, the better understanding of uh, this ongoing war that, as we said at the beginning, has been uh, ongoing for eight years. Uh, the next event we'll have at the Middle East Institute will happen uh, in about uh, three weeks. On 27 of April, we'll uh, be uh, uh, having a book launch with the authors of an upcoming book on the uh, Indo-Pacific strategies, where we'll be discussing uh, the role of the Middle East in uh, the new Indo-Pacific geopolitics. Emil, uh, Elizabeth, again, thank you very much. Have a nice uh, day ahead. And uh, uh, every, uh, everyone uh, have a great uh, rest of the day uh, in Singapore.